Well, here we are. Uh, I think I've shared this story before, but I wanted to start with this anyways. I'm a huge fan of The Office, and there's this one scene, which is actually my favorite scene in the entire series, right? Every episode, this is my favorite. There's this part. Anybody into The Office here at all? Am I talking to myself? Okay. So a few of you will enjoy this. Um, and I think it's worth going back to YouTube or something and watching this clip. But there's a scene where uh, Dunder Mifflin, the paper comp company in Scranton, Pennsylvania, uh, is about to get uh, shut down, right? And so Michael, who's the manager of the uh, branch in Scranton, and one of his um, colleagues, Dwight, they decide to go to the CFO's house in uh, either Connecticut or upstate New York or something. So uh, they go there, and they're waiting in front of his house, and they determine that they are going to spend the entire day, if they have to, waiting for uh, the CFO to confront him about not closing the branch, right? And so they're there, they're waiting, and they're refusing to answer any phone calls that are coming to their cell phones. But while they're there at David Wallace's house waiting, there are things happening in the real world, including the Scranton branch not getting shut down and the, some other branch uh, getting shut down instead. And they're trying to call Michael to tell him that Scranton is not getting shut down. But they won't answer the phone, so they don't know. So they're all despondent and they're waiting around and it's dark. David Wallace has not shown up. They feel like failures. And then Dwight, the um, colleague that was with Michael, decides to check his voicemail. And he hears on the voicemail that Scranton is not getting shut down, right? Stanford is getting shut down. Scranton is not getting shut down. And then he says, Michael, Michael, we did it. And Michael says, we did it. And they start dancing and celebrating, screaming, we did it, we did it. And then they look at each other and go, how did we do it? <laughs> and that's kind of my sentiment today. How do we do it? How did we get to this point? It's not like we did nothing. We did some things. But the sum of the parts is greater than its whole. Like, how did we get here, though? And I think that's kind of the story of life. You know, life consists of peaks and valleys. And LCC went through a, a valley. And you say, well, how did we get here? How did we get out of the valley? We did it. How do we do it? Right? So that's kind of uh, the sentiment that I'm coming to you this morning. And uh, the sermon title is Longing for Shepherds. And I planned, I've been working on this talk for um, maybe a month or six weeks or something. I, I, I had this sermon in mind for today, anticipating uh, what would happen and hoping uh, for these outcomes that we are on the receiving end of and celebrating today. So uh, I want to invite you to close your eyes as I share this sermon with you. God, thank you for the journey that you have been leading us on. Thank you that our hope is in you, and thank you that you speak to your people, and I pray that you would give this body, this church, a word today that would be helpful for them uh, for many more seasons to come. So be with us now, and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's my uh, belief, whether you are a Christian or uh, subscribe to another religion, whether you are an atheist, whether you don't think about these things at all, whatever you are, whatever label, whatever self-identification you have, I think all of us, this is my belief, we all long for God. And God stands for different things, and, you know, people have different dictionaries for God. Uh, but in, in my dictionary, God is uh, the true leader. He's the leader of my life. And he is my true father. And he is the true shepherd. Uh, over the years, I've, I've fallen in love uh, all over again with this word that I had rejected actually for many years, and that's the word shepherd. I like the idea of what a shepherd is. 
I don't understand much about shepherds. I'm not part of an agrarian culture or anything. Uh, but uh, shepherd, shepherding consists of uh, being loving and being kind and being faithful. It also includes correcting and disciplining and being somebody who truly leads and coaches and guides and, and uh, if necessary, dies for the sheep. So I love that uh, God has taken on this metaphor for us. And I understand when I look at human history, when I look at the events of our culture all over the world, I see that human beings have a deep, innate, I would say ancient longing for shepherds, for maybe the shepherd. And I think this shepherd that we all long for is namely God. And no matter how we label it, no matter how much we bury it, I see this longing express itself at every turn. Uh, I want to give you a couple examples here. I'll list them out here. We'll go into a couple of them later. Um, so whenever there's a funeral, whenever somebody dies in your life, you will experience something called a double grief. And a double grief is, let's say your father dies, and then you will grieve the father that you lost. But actually deeper and more painful than the grieving of your actual father is the grieving of the ideal father you never got to have. You're grieving the loss of the opportunity for a better relationship that you long to have with your actual father, but now that he's passed, that chance is gone. And that's really the breaking of your heart. You really, really wanted to have a certain kind of relationship with your father, and you really wanted him and needed him to be something, somebody, some ideal, maybe romanticized version of a father. So that to me is a little bit of a clue and evidence that here's my earthly father, but when my earthly father passes, I understand that what drove the relationship that I had with my father was not just the actual one, but it was actually for something deeper, that this earthly father was just a placeholder. And we know this, but we were hoping that this father was the actual father we wanted. But it turns out we have a deeper longing, a longing for somebody that's truer, that's better, that's more lovely, more loving, a better father. And that has nothing to do with our earthly fathers. Another example is the disappointment slash admiration we have for leaders. Why do we get so easily starstruck? Why are we so quick to put people on a pedestal? Why do we do that? Why does society do that? Uh, I have one of my kids who went through a phase of trying to go to all these concerts. I remember uh, she would discover people and she would go to their concerts when they were nothing, like when they were just in a tiny little room, there's only like 40 people there. She'd go to these concerts. And then she'd come back with paraphernalia, with shirts, and, and then she'd wait around to take pictures with these people. Like, I didn't teach her to idolize people. Why do we have this uh, sort of like idol-making factory that's so alive and kicking inside of us? That's another clue to me, that we really have a deep, ancient longing for something, for someone. Third example, uh, research shows that when societies, countries, you know, towns and cities, when they're going through vulnerable uh, seasons, when they are under threat, when they feel duress, when there's calamity, when they're in trouble, they are then most vulnerable to dictatorships. Companies, too. Studies show that companies who are in trouble tend to feel most attracted to despots. Why? Why do we orient towards leaders? Um, there's this theory that I really, really like called social information processing theory. And this theory explains that all human beings 
because of our uh, nature as social creatures. We just can't help but orient towards the leader. We keep looking for who the leader is in a group. And then we orient towards that leader and we take cues from that leader. And we use the reality of the leader to help define our own reality. It's so interesting. Like, why do we do that? We can't help it. To me, that's another clue that we have this longing for God, for a true shepherd. And here's what I want to say today about that. All leaders are placeholders. All parents are placeholders. All teachers are placeholders. Anybody we look up to are placeholders. Just just hang on. Just look at this person for a while because I'm coming back. Who's coming back? Who's going to reveal? It's, I think it's God. And that's what I want to share with you uh, today. And I wanted to share this word today because Pastor Howard is here and I wanted to help uh, set you all up by helping to adjust your expectations. A friend of mine says, if you want to have a bad day, have expectations right? And so if you expect Pastor Howard to be something he's not, something only God is supposed to be, you're not going to have a good day. We know how that story goes. Same thing with Pastor Howard. If he expects you all to be darling little angels, I know you all have been putting your best foot forward up to now, right? But close the front door and then, you know, the drama of human begins, uh, humanity begins to unfold. So it really isn't about uh, putting our best foot forward, but it's about understanding that everybody is just human. And we are all just placeholders. And yet we still have this longing. And the trap, the temptation is to forget this and to have our expectations morph into something that's going to lead inevitably to disappointment and failure and frustration. So at best, Howard, Pastor Howard, is your under-shepherd. But the chief shepherd of our souls, Scripture says, is Christ himself. And so in his success, may he remind you of Jesus. And in his failure, may he remind you of Jesus. If he does well, you think, oh, that was like Jesus. And if he fails, you say, ah, that's why we're waiting for Jesus. (laughs) So longing for shepherds. Let's read this passage. Uh, Read along with me on the screen as I read out loud. So I exhort the elders among you as fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So two points today, longing for shepherds and the shepherd's longing. Verse 4 says, when the chief shepherd appears. The context of Peter's writing is important. He mentions this in an earlier verse, uh, but the context is suffering. He was writing to a scattered church, And they were scattered because of the persecution that Christians were experiencing at the time. Now, you all probably know that. Uh, But suffering reminds us of a longing that we have. And when the people that Peter was writing to experienced suffering, this longing pointed to their longing for a better leader. Because all of the suffering that these churches were experiencing had to do with bad leaders, 
leaders with huge egos, leaders who were narcissistic, leaders who were not loving, leaders who were not humble, leaders who were not stewards, leaders who were not servants, leaders who wanted to not serve people but use people for their own gain and glory. So what does Peter remind them of? He says, when the chief shepherd appears, reminding them this longing you have This suffering is reminding you of the fact, the reality of Jesus himself. He alone is the true lover of your souls. Nobody else loves you anyways. Even the very best lovers on earth pale in comparison to the true lover of your soul. Even the very best leaders pale in comparison to the chief shepherd who will appear. This is Peter's reminder. Um, fascinating, fascinating research by uh, uh, Taj Rai in an article he wrote called How Could They? I want to read you this kind of longer quote, but it's really, really good. You're going to remember this. Okay, it says this. It looks like both leading theories of violence fail for one reason or another. Neither the disinhibition theory nor the rational theory provides a complete picture for why people hurt one another. Okay, let me pause there for a second. Um, Taj and his team, they did this massive undertaking. I think this was um, at Northwestern University. Okay, he was working with a renowned uh, anthropologist, a man whose name you might remember or uh, recall from college, Alan Fisk, right? So he's studying the nature of violence. And he asked the question, why are human beings so violent? Why do we hurt each other? Why do we do the things that we do? And so this is what he was studying, and this is what he finds. What are we missing? The theories that we have had currently, the disinhibition theory or the rational theory, none of this provides an explanation according to the research that he conducted as to why human beings are violent and have been violent throughout history. But he does find an answer. We analyzed violent practices across cultures and history. We examined records of war, torture, genocide, honor killing, animal and human sacrifice, homicide, suicide, intimate partner violence, rape, corporal punishment, execution, trial by combat, police brutality, hazing, castration, dueling, feuding, contact sports. This is a really depressing list. This is our resume, by the way, as human beings. And the violence immortalized by gods and heroes and more. I don't even want to read the exhaustive list. That was, a, that was an executive summary of a list. We combed through first-person accounts, ethnographic observations, historical analyses, demographic data, and experimental investigations of violence. And then he concludes, the work was depressing. Right? You believe that, right? Here's the, here's the really interesting thing, though. We did, in fact, find a pattern in all the violence. There was a unifying theme with all the predictive and explanatory power one could wish for. Across practices, across cultures, and throughout historical periods, when people support and engage in violence, here's the reason why human beings are violent. Their primary motivations are moral. It's getting so good. Ready? By moral, I mean that people are violent because they feel they must be. Because they feel that their violence is obligatory. They know that they are harming fully human beings. Nonetheless, they believe they should. Violence does not stem from a psychopathic lack of morality. Quite the reverse. It comes from the exercise of perceived 
moral rights and obligations. Oh my goodness. I can't believe how clarifying this is. You understand what Taj is saying? He studied everything, every culture throughout history. And you, you, you heard the list of types of violence he studied. He says there's one pattern that emerges. Everybody is violent because they feel like they have to be. They're violent not because they want to do the wrong thing. People are violent because they want to do the right thing. What he's saying is we are violent because of our longing for justice, not because of our love for injustice. You know that long, ancient, innate sense of fairness you had when you were two years old? And you said, mine! That's your tendency for violence rooted in your sense of fairness, your sense of what's right not your love for what is wrong. You don't have to look very far to understand that we have a longing for God himself. The reason human beings have been violent, are violent, and probably will continue to be violent is because of our longing for God himself, for the true shepherd to appear finally, and stop the suffering. We want suffering to stop. That's why we cause suffering. If I might get a little bit personal, the stuff that all went down with you all as a church and all the behaviors that I got to study and try to understand, here's what I learned. Every single person I talked to Every single person, they believed in their own intentions. Now, the impact was different than the intentions often. The intention was good. Desiring justice, fairness, truth, even love. But the impact was often felt violently. It hurt It led to more chaos, not more order. And that's why it's so hard to resolve conflict because everybody judges themselves by their own intentions and judges other people by their impact. Somebody says, you hurt me. Another person says, I didn't mean to. And now we're at a stalemate. Because somebody's anchoring on their own intention and the other person is anchoring on the impact that it had on them. One person says it was love, the other person said it was violent. And so on and so forth. That's how society goes. And underneath all of it is a longing for the truth, for what is right, for what is good are longing for the chief shepherd to appear. Violence is just our mishandling, our illegitimate way to solve very legitimate problems. We're good at identifying the problem. We're just terrible at solving it because the longing is there. but We don't know how to translate that longing to reality. And so Peter says, the chief shepherd, when he appears. You know, this phrase, chief shepherd, this is the only part in the whole Bible that this phrase is ever used. One time, here it is. Now, this shepherd metaphor is really, really, really common. I want to read you a few verses. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. What happens If God is your shepherd, I shall not want. You know what our lives are? I want. That defines the whole story. Like, it's everything. Why is Peter the way he is? Why does he do what he does? Why does he spend the time and the money and the resources? Like, what's driving everything? 
Peter wants. Why do you do what you do? You want. See, your want is a longing for what? The true shepherd. And when we have the true shepherd, all is at rest. We are like orphans looking for a home. And until we're home, we're going to keep looking. We're going to be in want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Then and only then I shall stop wanting. Isaiah 40, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. John 10, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. John 10 again, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Verse 2 in our passage says, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. God's longing is to return to us, reveal himself. But until that time, he conveys his shepherd presence in the world through leaders. Leadership is a thing. Because of the way we are wired, because of the way we are oriented, because of the ancient longing we have. But he has specific instructions for shepherds. What does he say? Verse 2, not under compulsion, but willingly. You know what that means? It means that it is an honor to be a leader. It is a privilege. It is a trust. Leaders who have had trust taken away know, suddenly realize that they've taken the trust for granted. That the power that allows you to lead is in the people that the leader is leading, not in the leader. Because as soon as the followers say no, the leader's out of a job. So it's a mutual agreement that's ba based on trust. And this is what Peter is saying. Exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. Don't put people in debt and make them feel like they owe you. All right? It's a partnership. Verse 2 again says, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. It's not about your ego. It's not about what you're entitled to. It's not about what you gain. But it's about an opportunity to serve and give to the other. And then verse 3, not domineering, but being examples to the flock. There are many, 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 many bad shepherds, hired hands, as Jesus put it, in the world. And the suffering in the world can be explained by people who are bad leaders, people who didn't follow these guidelines. They're compulsive. They don't understand the honor in it. They do it for shameful gain, and they're domineering rather than being examples. This explains kind of everything. Do you want to understand what's happened in Afghanistan, what's been happening? Trace it. It goes all back to the leaders. Leaders of our country, leaders of their country, leaders of other countries. Whatever, whatever you're curious about, trace it. You know, go back to the leaders. When I first came to uh, you guys nine months ago and I was interviewing everybody and trying to do my own, you know, generate my own understanding about what happened, and I wrote my report, the basic Executive summary of the report is all the leaders have to take responsibility and they have to fall on their swords. It doesn't matter the details. It doesn't matter who did what, who said what, when, how. All the leaders take responsibility. If you don't take responsibility, you can't move forward. Because it goes back to the leaders. There's a lot of bad shepherds out there. 
But the truth is, there's no elder or father or mother or ruler or leader that can do what only God can do. So our life here on earth really is just longing, waiting for the chief shepherd to appear. Um, This word father in the Bible appears 1,836 times. That's a lot of times the word father appears. That means that it's a metaphor that God wants to use to explain to us how this works. So here it is. Father, the idea of father is the primary elder in our world. That's our first and foundational experience of leadership in the world. This is where the longing for Jesus himself starts getting fanned by the way we experience our earthly fathers. I know that not everybody has this experience. I know life is full of different circumstances, but in general, I'm speaking. For the majority of people, it's the father. The father is God's primary way of shepherding us, provision and protection. And so whenever a father dies, whenever there's a funeral service for a father, you are grieving the death of your earthly father. So that's true. But then you're also, as I explained earlier, you're grieving the death of the ideal father you never got to have. And that loss really, really stings. Because now what do you do? As long as he was alive, even if he was a bad father, there's still some hope that you could still have a relationship. Right? And that was that was part of the comfort that that mitigated the full brunt of his failure as a father is maybe he won't fail tomorrow. And then there's an invitation as part of your grieving process to accept your actual father as he was. And you're able to smile and enjoy him looking back on some of the stories But ultimately, you have to end, land on this anticipation of the true father you were longing for all along. Yeah, your earthly father was a failure, but he was always meant to fail. In fact, every father fails compared to God himself, which is really, really what it was all about in the first place. So I want to read you some verses about fathers. Isaiah 63. For you are our father through Abraham does not know us. Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. 1 John 3, see what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. 2 Corinthians 6, 18, and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Matthew 23, 9. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Hebrews 7. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, He remains a priest perpetually. And so I charge you today to never, ever idolize leaders ever again. Your job is to maintain a clear understanding of the fact that every leader in your life will fail. Every boss, every manager, every CEO, Every CFO, David Wallace, every pastor, every mother, they will all fail. The Bible is clear. We are all waiting and longing for the chief shepherd. And when he appears, until he is our shepherd, we shall want. And life on earth isn't about getting rid of that want, but it's using that want to remind us that life is about 
being in a place of want, about living with this tension, living unresolved. If you try to get rid of the want, you're going to fail, but you're going to be collecting stuff and, and trying things and wasting your life trying to get rid of something that will never, ever go away. Because God put that in you so that you will long for him. No spouse, no relationship, no thing, no car, no job, no adventure. Nothing is ever going to satisfy you. You will be in want until the chief shepherd appears. But when he does, when he does. And so with that backdrop, I want to invite Pastor Howard to come on up. Come on up, Pastor Howard. <laughs> he doesn't know what's going to happen, but I did tell him I was going to call him up, right? <laughs> so uh, I want to just pray uh, for uh, you all as a church and pray for Pastor Howard. And it's not like a traditional prayer, but I think this is really appropriate. I hope this sets all of us up to really do well as a church. Would you bow your heads with me? Church, I want to invite you with God in our midst to release Pastor Howard to be fully human. Say in your hearts, Pastor Howard, I release you to be human. You are, at best, an under-shepherd. You will do the best you can. You will serve, you will love, you will give. But you will not always succeed. But whether you succeed or you fail, we will always be reminded of Jesus himself. We will not use your humanity to reject you. But we will all the more embrace you as our fellow brother in Christ. And Howard, these are the people that God has put you in charge uh, over to love and to serve and to remind them of Christ, not pointing to yourself, not pointing to your agenda, but to listen to God's voice together and to be followers together. So God, I want to um, just entrust this body, this congregation to you, Pastor Howard and the church here, um, to seek after you to continue to long after you, to follow you together, and to wait for you together. Thank you for this season we've gone through. Thank you for this uh, wonderful moment. God, I bless this church. I bless Pastor Howard. I ask you to fill them with your Holy Spirit. And may they make you proud. May you be pleased. I lift them up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, let's just respond to the sermon. Let's respond to the longing of our shepherd.